All right, well, welcome everybody to our panel on inclusive humanitarian aid. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, situations of emergency and humanitarian crises, of course, have ramifications for all members of society, but those ramifications can be exacerbated for people with disabilities, uh, for whom societal barriers can become much worse during situations of emergency. Uh, we're very fortunate these days that we now have a number of frameworks internationally in place to address these issues between Article 9 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, the Sendai framework, and now the SDGs also um, are responsive to the need for societies to plan, prepare, and respond to situations of emergency in a way that uh, is truly disability inclusive. It's not all doom and gloom though. We do have opportunities after emergencies have passed to ensure that we are building back better and making sure that we're not only not reinstating barriers that existed before, but that we're taking the opportunity to start afresh and really build back better societies. So our panelists today, we have a wonderful panel who will be addressing a variety of these aspects of how to plan for and respond to humanitarian emergencies. We have, if you'd just like to wave, Dorji Chering Sherpa from Sky Memorial Foundation. We have Alex Christopoulos of the Lumos Foundation. We have Berendi Raj Pukarel from Action on Disability Rights and Development. Would you like to wave, Berendi? Yes. Just wave your hand. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> we have um, Iona Susrianti of FKM BKA Indonesia, who's also here with her colleague, Mr. Sherufuddin. So we'll be starting with Dorji. Would you like to queue up the PowerPoint, please? I would invite you, please, to read the bios of our wonderful speakers in your conference materials. I don't want to take time today to do that. We want to give the time over to the presentations and make sure we have plenty of time left over at the end for Q&A with you. We would like this to be as interactive as possible. So please, if you have questions, we'll hold them till the end, but we do want to, to hear from you. So Dorji, whenever you are, do we have your, I think it needs to. Can't see down there. Yeah. Can we bring up Dorji's PowerPoint on the monitor in front, please? There we go, got it. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, the chairperson of this uh, session and my uh, fellow delegate from UK, Indonesia, and Nepal. Uh, my name is Dorji Chering Sherpa. I'm from Nepal. I've been in travel trade and tourism business uh, for 35 years. And, uh, and presently, I'm the founding chairman of Sky Memorial Foundation. And uh, we are involved in providing education, healthcare, and, uh, and basic uh, income generating works in the remote villages of Nepal. Now I would like to go back to some incident. Uh, uh, on the early morning of August 24th, August 2010, a plane carrying 14 people were on the way to Mount Everest region and uh, due to bad weather, it was diverted uh, and it was on its way to Kathmandu and it crashed in a remote village in Bastipur where all the 14 people died, including my youngest daughter, Sara Sherpa. Uh, after that uh, horrible incident, uh, uh, we, uh, the parents of, uh, there were 14, there were eight Nepalese, four Americans, one Japanese, and one Englishman. And uh, we, the, then I initiated uh, to get in touch with the families, and then ultimately we met the three family. One, uh, uh, Mr. Howard Fallon, his youngest daughter was Kendra, and then our Japanese the mother, uh, the, her son was uh, Yuki Hayashi, and of course my youngest daughter, Sara. And the name happened to be SKY because my daughter is Sara, Kendra is American daughter, and uh, Yuki is the son of the Japanese mother. So we founded this uh, small organization, and uh, we the parents decided to turn our grief into strength, you know, helping the people in those villages uh, uh, we established uh, uh, almost 14 primary schools. It has been almost eight years now. And uh, uh, during the eight years, uh, we, have, uh, we have managed to 
uh, change the lives of the uh, village people down there uh, in the remote villages. So we are quite satisfied with what we have done. And later on, we uh, established, we realized that the health issue was very, uh, very important to the villagers because to, to get a simple ordinary tablet, they had to walk almost three, four hours down to the main town. So we constructed a building and then we got a nurse, uh, a health assistant and provided free medicine to, uh, to the surrounding villages. There were almost five or six villages uh, where the people get uh, the health service. <coughs> Awesome. And during, uh, in Nepal, uh, we had a, a big earthquake in 2015 where a lot of people were uh, injured, many people died, and uh, we are still recovering from that uh, earthquake, uh, earthquake. And uh, the first thing we realized, uh, Sky Memorial Foundation realized that there are a lot of disabled uh, organizations are in Kathmandu Valley, so we immediately rushed to those places uh, to provide the necessary uh, relief, uh, you know, immediate tarpaulin and food stuffs and all those things. So there was one uh, organization uh, kid, uh, taking care of 40 cerebral palsy uh, children and uh, we assured them we will make a, a small home for them immediately. So we immediately uh, started uh, to get donors for them and the Friends of Sky came up and then we constructed a, a home for these uh, CVDS children. So now they are living in a very safe and very comfortable home there. And this is one of the things that uh, we, Sky was involved in inclusive humanitarian aid to disabled uh, people. Mm. Uh, there is another organization known as EPSA in Nepal, and uh, they are taking, uh, they are doing a wonderful work, uh, giving employment and training and and uh, you know, income generating work uh, to disabled girls and single mothers in Kathmandu. So last year, actually, this APSA was the awardee of the Zero Project here also. So we helped them since uh, four years, and that was the house they were living in. Uh, you can see the condition of the houses there. During monsoon, is uh, not uh, very comfortable, of course. So we have uh, uh, we initiated uh, to uh, provide them. Uh, with a good uh, uh, place to live. So we initiated to give them a dream of having their own home. So we managed to get uh, land in, uh, in Kathmandu and then, uh, then we built these houses. We have two houses, uh, prefabricated houses, earthquake resistant, and now one house is almost completed, which is a totally disabled friendly, and it will be ready before the monsoon. So we are planning to move these girls there very soon. And uh, in Nepal, uh, we, Nepal is a very geographically very difficult, uh, uh, difficult terrain uh, with a lot of mountain hills and all those places. And uh, disabled people all cannot come to Kathmandu, the capital. So we uh, we decided to go to the village in the far west of Nepal, where we uh, help one disabled, uh, small disabled uh, children in school and provided wheelchairs to uh, to the 20 people in the village. And while working with disabled uh, organization, we came to realize that the children of the disabled parents are very smart, talented, and wanted to do uh, studies in school and all that, but uh, due to their poverty, they cannot. So we have uh, managed to, since three years, we've been uh, helping 20 such children, uh, providing them uh, with education, clothes, and all the things. And uh, that has been quite satisfying. They are very happy. The children are doing good. Um, and uh, besides this, we have, uh, I think I've uh, gone a little faster. We, we managed to make uh, some roads uh, in the villages. Yeah, that is, uh, uh, we have made uh, road access in the villages. It's very difficult. So during the monsoon, they cannot come travel around. So we made three track roads in the, in the remote villages where now economic, economic uh, development is taking place and uh, uh, it's very convenient for them. And, uh, so uh, we are involved actually in uh, many other issues such as uh, uh, earthquake and flood relief uh, and then we are helping a lot of uh, orphanages in, uh, in Kathmandu and around the uh, villages of senior citizens and we have initiated a immediate relief to natural disaster uh, since four years. So in 
In Nepal, it's been a very, uh, during the monsoon, we have landslide and floods and all that, and the poor people are the ones who suffer. So we do, we have been uh, able to uh, provide uh, help as much as we can. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we are very proud is we have uh, managed to get together with other organizations with a similar, uh, similar agendas. So we have a uh, concept of joining hands and sharing experience with other organizers, and, and we identify the uh, project. We, uh, Sky Memorial Foundation has uh, friends in all the villages, so we uh, identify the, the, the most needed project, and then, and then we get our uh, friends, uh, and then we jointly uh, complete the project. So we monitor, we <coughs> handle this project, and hand over to the village. And our main uh, issue, the success story is that we ask them to have 30% uh, uh, of, of their uh, commitment and 70% is financed by us, which has been a great success. And so we now are very proud to have uh, support uh, from uh, Zero Project, uh, creating a platform for a small organizers like us. And I hope to uh, learn so many things here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Orji. <coughs> Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Christopoulos. I work at Lumos Foundation, and my slides aren't there, but I, shall, I only have nine minutes, and I have a lot to cover, so I shall start, and hopefully at some point the, the slides will accompany me. They're up. Perfect. There's a lot of things that I'd like to cover in these nine minutes, so I'll probably speak a bit more quickly than I would like to, but if there are any points that people want to follow up on the end, please, please do feel free to contact uh, me and we can have a conversation at the end of today. I work for an organisation called LUMOS and our mission is to help keep children in their families and in their communities and to work with governments and other partners to start to transition away from systems that rely on institutional care, such as orphanages, to help children live in the community. The situation of children who live in institutional care globally is, is quite unknown. Uh, it's estimated that there are about 8 million children who are separated from their families, taken away out of their communities, that live in institutions. Uh, the statistics are, are quite poor. Uh, in some countries like Russia, it's, it's uh, estimated that about 400,000 children live in institutional care. In other countries like Cambodia, various different counts have shown it could range from anything from 16,000 to 40,000. But what we know is in almost any country, there is a reliance of some kind on institutional care. There's a huge myth that orphanages are full of orphans, whereas in fact, documented quite consistently in most countries, where, it's, where the research has been uh, conducted, that between 80 and 90% of children who are in orphanages and other kinds of institutions have a living parent or parents who, with the right kind of support, could look after their, their child. Um, some of the key drivers for why children end up getting separated from their families, separated from their communities, poverty tends to be the main one, lack of access to services, discrimination, disability, uh, and conflict, conflict and disasters, situations where children are pulled away, pulled out of a, their family and community situation to be looked after in a separate, isolated environment. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, for children who grow up in institutional care, separate from their, um, from their families and the basic care and love that families can provide, children do worse across all domains that you can measure, um, their education, physical, emotional development is, is harmed um, in institutional care, um, a much heightened risk of suffering from uh, harm and abuse as well. And particularly in situations we're talking about today, emergencies, humanitarian responses, where that separation can be quite quick and the kind of place that children are put into can be a lot less well documented and regulated and have standards, obviously the, height, the, the risk of um, abuse and harm is, is heightened. Most people who run institutions or who place children in institutions do so with the best intentions um, because a lot of the time when faced with a situation where children might be uh, in a vulnerable situation, the response can be, well, I'll put them in a house that I know that they'll get really good care and at least they're in these four walls and they're with other children that 
um, that we can provide them with, with a level of care they might not get at, at home. And so there's this issue where orphanages are set up with good intentions, but they start to create this pull factor, for, for, to, um, the, the, a magnet that draws children into them. And what we've seen a lot is international aid, international volunteering starts to create a parallel system to, to care systems in a country where often institutions, orphanages, are set up actually simply just to provide an experience for international volunteers or international money. And it's a really big money-making business. And once you set up an orphanage, you need to fill it with orphans. And what we've seen a lot, and we've been able to document in a number of countries, is children are actively recruited, families are co co coerced or deceived to give their children up into orphanages. And certainly in Haiti, a country we work in, we've seen a, lo a lot of examples where um, child finders have a fee to recruit children into an orphanage where they'll go in, they'll see a, a pregnant mother in a, in a poor community, they'll pay for her health bills. When the child is born, the mother will be presented with a uh, bill for the health care. She can't pay it, so the child is taken and placed in an institution. And certainly, again, in times of humanitarian responses where there aren't, there aren't the structures that you can rely on, perhaps, to, to do effective case management of a child, that separation is easier and quicker to do. Just to give you an example, in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010, we, it was documented there was a 150% increase in the number of orphanages uh, in the country. And although some orphans were created in Haiti due to um, parents dying, what we saw was not so much an orphan crisis, but an orphanage crisis where a huge number of orphanages were set up a lot of that with just well-intended um, international do donations, that that was the response and a parallel system to um, the government system of care was, was created. And um, the kind of conditions in the orphanages are incredibly poor. Um, just to give you an example, we, we worked to close down an orphanage for 41 children. When we went to that orphanage, the door was opened by a five-year-old girl. The care was provided by a 15-year-old um, child. And with a bit of support, we were able to reunify 40 of the 41 children in that orphanage back with their families. The one child that we couldn't place back was only 10 months old, and there was absolutely no record of where they were born or any link to their families. Um, we wanted to document why this is happening and what the kind of pull factors are for um, people setting up orphanages. And we were able to document 100, at least 100 million US dollars went into Haitian orphanages um, in 2015. Now that's less, uh, over half the amount of total US aid that goes into Haiti. So it's a huge pull factor that does create this incentive to set up orphanages and, and fill them uh, with orphans. And if you could think about what that money could do in somewhere like Haiti, you could put three quarters of a million children in school for a year. And education is one of the key drivers of why children are, are separated from their families. 85% of orphanages in, in Haiti aren't even registered with the government as well. So you've got this huge amount of money that goes into an unregulated system. So it's an easy way to make a lot of money um, at the expense of children. And so when Hurricane Matthew happened in 2016, one of the responses we did straight away was to put in place a system to document um, children in the orphanage system there because what you see is this huge movement of children with absolutely no system that, that documents it, which is rife for trafficking, rife for... Um, exploitation and we put in place a system to be able to document any movements in and out of orphanages and the establishment of new orphanages to um, to make sure that people couldn't take tear children away from their families with, with no uh, no adequate documentation this is a global issue the same thing was seen in, in Nepal after the earthquake the same thing in Indonesia that well-intended responses to provide some short-term care for children end up just becoming a long-term response that segregates and isolates children from their communities. And particularly what we've seen with, with certain groups of children, such as children with disabilities, there's an increase. Children with disabilities in institutional care, especially girls with disabilities, are much more likely to suffer harm, abuse, and exploitation in this form of care. And again, it's well intended that children are sent to institutions to remove them from a situation that's harmful, but in fact it increases the um, level of harm that they will um, experience. I've got one minute to go, so I'll very quickly rattle through my recommendations. But the first thing, the data is so poor in situations, even in non-humanitarian situations, that <clears throat> many governments or humanitarian actors don't even know 
the group of children they're trying to serve or their needs. Most funding goes into responding to humanitarian issues rather than preparing. So again, it's easy to fund a building or an orphanage rather than actually trying to put in place measures that could keep children with their families in the communities. <clears throat> and, and perhaps just the, the final point um, I'll make, so I've only got a few seconds le left, is actually responses to safeguarding children are often seen as, a, as an afterthought and actually putting in place measures to make sure that the basic needs of children are protected and that lots of foreigners with no background checks, with no... I'll just, I'll finish my sentence, but, but with no, yeah, start it, so I'll finish. Um, with no checks can come in and have access to children that, in my country, in the UK, I'd never let my child be looked after by an 18-year-old who just came into the country with no understanding, no qualifications, no use. Yet in humanitarian systems, we feel it's very legitimate to send someone with absolutely no background to take care of a vulnerable group of children. So that really needs to be put into the planning, and I've gone over my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. We've got uh, Berendi next, and we'll just bring up the slide. Berendi's very kindly trusting me with the magic clicker. I shall uh, do my best to make sure that I get this right. There we go. You're on. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Birendra Raj Pokhrel, and I represent the disability community in Nepal. So it's my great privilege to be here the chairperson, the colleagues from Nepal, UK and Indonesia, and all delegates here. Before going to my presentation, I would like to emphasize uh, what uh, my organization is. Immediately after the enforcement of uh, CRPD, we established this organization for pushing for the ratification of the convention. And uh, one of our strategy was to implement the accessible technology. So the advocacy succeeded for the ratification of the convention, and uh, we are also focusing more on collaboration of the achievement of the disability targets within SDG. With the greatest endeavor of this organization, we are succeed to get uh, International Excellence Award in London Book Fair, as well as the Jero Project Conference Award in Accessible ICT in 2016. So, as I am going to brief you about uh, the devastating earthquake, that is, I focus more on my presentation about the humanitarian action during the post-earthquake and the, during the earthquake in Nepal, as uh, my previous colleagues, colleague, Mr. Gurung mentioned that there was a devastating earthquake in 2015, April 25. Many people lost their lives, and as we counted, many people were injured. And immediately after that, we were also shocking very much, and then finally we decided to go for rescue and some humanitarian work from our side. One story came into my mind that uh, a boy of 11 years old he was wrongly treated by the teachers, giving them wrong information. If there is shocking, then you have to go below your table. The boy did the same. The house fell down. The boy collapsed. So that is the story in Nepalese context. We are giving the disaster information in accessible way. So in this way, we try to work in post-disaster reform accessible for all. So we realize that uh, people with disability are deprived of getting the emergency services as well as the relief and the rescue. Though many organizations work collaboratively, here also some representatives from other organizations work collaboratively. We all join hands, though, despite of these initiatives, the services were not reached to the unreached people. Then we try to transforming the rights 
in the real ground. We also realize that there is a violation of basic human rights of people with disability if the services are not accessible to them. Then Adrat intended to push for the disaster, the disability inclusive humanitarian action in the post earthquake reform. We came with a project with the essence that we would like to accommodate people with disabilities, engagement of the people with disability in the post earthquake reform. We mobilized the paralegals, giving them more training, and they were engaged in the local decision making. We mapped the local need assessment. It was conducted by the government, by the post earthquake reconstruction commission. And finally, we conducted the public accountability audit. And finally, the follow-up of the post earthquake reform and the reconstruction plan. So in all this area, the essence was that the people with disability were the active actor of the process. So we cover 14 districts, and uh, the government had some uh, policy regarding the accessibility. It is the accessible standards that we wanted to execute during the planning and the reconstruction of the public places. And we also established the intergovernmental coordination for all these initiatives, and the persons with disabilities were again the major actor for this overall self-advocacy process. So finally, we influenced the local government people to ensure the accessibility standards within the public places. For these initiatives, we have some impact that we created. Very recently, Nepal has amended the act, and within this act, it has been driven by Article 11 of CRPD for the accessible and the inclusive disaster preparedness plan. We have 67, 65 persons with disability who got government service for the first phase grant for the reconstruction of their house. S some meetings, 72 meetings, were joined by the people with disability as paralegals. Pe the public places are being accessible. And we provided the accessibility standards orientation training to the designers and the construction, construction workers. And they designed the public places accessible for all. So these are the very good result of the project. Now the government has the post orthodox reform plan and that clearly mentioned that the disability inclusion could be, would be the priority and some, the project result has been replicated beyond the project districts. Government has assigned some of the DPOs for the monitoring of this reconstruction work. And again, we have very recently the three layers of election of the state structure, and their disability has been included one of the agenda for the developing development initiatives. And again, some of the districts are all again implementing these accessibility standards. Here I have a successful story, he is a person from Dading, and he pushed the government for the accessible reconstruction. Finally, there was accessible buildings constructed by the government. And uh, for this project, we didn't have uh, lots of grants. We, we were supported by the Open Society Institute, and uh, there, were, there was non-funding applications from the network of this organization. So the active engagement of the local DPOs is the core value of the success of the project. A and now I go for very quick. We, we are following the Asia Pacific engineering strategy for make the rights real that mentioned about the accessibility disaster preparedness plan. 
and that has been replicable for all part of the country. And uh, finally, we realize that the post earthquake reconstruction should be accessible for all, and that ensure the rights of persons with disability guaranteed by the legislation and uh, also by the government's commitments towards the achievement of the co gover government towards the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Now, fa finally, the government is going to adopt the new accessibility standards as well as implementation of the new legislation and the local bodies are going to make the plan accessible for all. And for these initiatives, people with disability and the Disabled People's Organization have an active role. They can play the active role to influence the local bodies to ensure that the disaster <coughs> preparedness as well as the humanitarian action can be accessible for all, accommodating persons with disability and inclusion. So this is the initiatives of ADRAD, and we also follow the principles of sustainable development goals, leaving no one behind. And with this motto, we're working collaboratively with the development partners, and we open hands, we extend our hands for the further collaboration to ensure the rights of people with disability and the humanitarian action. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much indeed. Erna, I'm gonna pass this to you, excuse me, thank sorry. You. Hi everybody, I hope you have a great time in the conference. I'm Erna Susrianti from Indonesia. So, could you please, for the slide? Okay. Today I'm going to present about the involvement of persons with disability in disaster risk reduction. Before I talk about the project, I would like to introduce you to our organization, FKMBKA. It's um, a communicational forum or a small organization that focus on the fulfillment of the right of persons with disability. If other organizations talk about national aspect and also international aspect, our organization focus on a small scale, which is our province in Aceh. Um, even though we work on general right of person with disability, but a couple of years before, we focus on the fulfillment of the right of person with disability in risk reduction, um, inclusive risk reduction. There are so many reasons why we focus on this subject, because um, Aceh, our province, is a disaster-prone region that is particularly afflicted by tsunami disaster and earthquake in 2004. But even though there are so many natural disasters happen in Aceh, the government never include persons with disability in register registrational system. Even um, the CAM is not accessible. And the lack of awareness of the stakeholders, especially government, make um, people with disability become more and more forgotten, not only uh, for general rights, but also about risk disaster management. Um, there are several things that we do that never have been done by the government before. For example, ensuring persons with disability to actively involve in all stages in disaster risk reduction process. Um, so from 2015 until 2017, we already held three disaster evacuation simulation for earthquake, tsunami disaster, and also volcanic eruption. And just now, there is a volcanic eruption in North Sumatra, close to Aceh, and the 
effect also felt by the people who live in Aceh. So we think that it is very important to give the knowledge for people with disability about this, about risk management, about the EVAC, and how to save themselves. And the last one, uh, 81 facilities in Aceh have been tested for the feasibility to provide accessible shelters in emergency. Because before the shelter, or like general shelter, there are no um, access, there is no assistance for persons with disability. And the next one, I will talk about the impact of our project. So, first one, uh, after we held the project, there is the increase of capacity and knowledge of people with disability in understanding about risk uh, disaster reduction, and also they know how to save themselves. For example, do something, just a little thing, maybe wait for uh, another volunteer to help them, but at least they do something, not just leave like give up when a uh, disaster happened. And the other one is, um, there's also pos positive policy changes in government. So currently our government commit to implement some uh, policy and they even include the policy in um, regulation and um, region policy. And also, Currently, people already familiar with a uh, disability issue because um, it also become, of, I don't know, focus from the media right now because we want to bring it up before people just don't care. They exclude the people with disability from the society. They don't get any chance to be actively participate. Um, okay, now I want to talk about uh, the real life story of Rosmawati. She's blind and 45 years old. Before uh, the workshop, she told us that she just gave up in any disaster. If disaster happened, like flood or earthquake, she just stayed home. She doesn't even try to save herself because she's kind of afraid because uh, if she tries to escape, she will hit anything in front of her. So after the workshop, she finally understand what she's going to do. And while waiting for uh, the volunteer, she yeah, do something. Um, who actually really important to save herself. I don't know, yeah. But our project also have many uh, difficulties. One of them is financial issues. Currently, we only have limited amount of funds. We only have uh, support from one organization, DRF, or Disability Right Fund. So I would like to say thank you to Ms. Tayana over there, who support our project. And also, uh, all of FKMBK staffs are volunteer. So yeah, some of these people need to do something for their, themselves, like uh, for a living, of course, but they do actively participate in FKM BKA because they want and think they need to do something. And the challenges that we face today is the low acceptance of people with disabilities by society and also the implementation of the new policy regarding the fulfillment of the right of people with disability. I mean, even though there are policy in uh, government regulation, but the implementation is still very low. Even when we already try to advocate it, still the government sometimes uh, do not include person with disability in development planning. And before I say thank you for your attention, I would like to introduce you to a person who become the project leader and the organization leader of FKMBKA. He's 
an underprivileged person, he is blind, but we give him an opportunity to do something big. I mean, I don't know, maybe in international or in your country, it's just normal for a person with disability to be on stage or to be um, like the leader, but not in Indonesia. So Mr. Sharifuddin would like to say something. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, selamat siang. Ya lanjut. Iya, bilang ya bilang terus. Nanti saya terjemahkan. Uh, yang saya hormatin uh, penyelenggara acara ini dan juga Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, saya adalah uh, so, salah satu dari sekian banyak orang yang diselamatkan oleh Tuhan uh, pada musibah gempa bumi dan gelombang tsunami yang melanda Aceh 26 Desember 2004 yang lalu. So, uh, he would like to say thank you for Zero Project um, team to give him opportunity to be on stage today. And he told you that he's one of the victims of tsunami disaster that happened in 2004. Ketika itu, uh, kami masih ada di rumah bertiga yaitu saya, istri saya, dan seorang teman. Jadi ketika gempa itu, ketika gempa terjadi, jangankan kita untuk dapat berjalan, berdiri pun tidak bisa. So when tsunami disaster happened in 2004, he was with two other people at home. Uh, when the earthquake happened, it is impossible to stand. And yeah, I mean, it's impossible. You have to sit or, I don't know, to do something else but not standing. Kemudian, uh, tidak lama, tidak lama, kira-kira 10, kurang lebih 15 menit, air pun datang. Dan saya uh, berupaya untuk menyelamatkan istri saya dengan meminta dia bergantung di ventilasi ataupun lubang angin pintu. Um, after 15 minutes after the earthquake and then tsunami came, he tried to save uh, his wife at that time. Yeah. <coughs> Karena sempat juga menghadapi kesulitan karena istri saya ternyata tidak lebih tinggi daripada saya sehingga Saya meminta agar supaya istri saya itu uh, naik di atas bahu saya, berdiri di atas bahu saya. Dan saya pun ber, apa, duduk, lalu istri saya naik di atas bahu saya, lalu saya berdiri, berpegangan pada dinding. Nah, maka istri saya pun menggapai uh, ventilasi tersebut. Ya udah. And uh, after that, she, he finally can save uh, his wife, but with so many difficulties because his wife actually also blind. <coughs> Kemudian tinggallah saya yang berdiri sambil berpenggangan ventilasi uh, pintu rumah terus. Dan tidak lama setelah air di bawah bibir seperti ini, uh, saya pun tidak tidak lagi sanggup bernapas maka saya katakan ya Allah ya Tuhan saya jika seandainya saya masih diperkenankan hidup ayo eh, dikas eh, kami pasrah dan rela karena kami milikmu dan ciptaanmu tapi kalau kami masih diperkenankan untuk hidup lebih lama kami berjanji akan memberikan yang terbaik untuk Aceh dan seketika itu air juga surut um, at that time he almost gave up um for life, I mean, he doesn't really try to save himself after he saved um, his wife. Um, and then he promised if he survive in that disaster, he will do something for people with disabilities, at least to write up about their um, rights to get inclusive disaster risk management. 
because before he never understand anything about saving himself in any disaster. Kemudian uh, saya pun melaksanakan janji tersebut dengan menyelenggarakan berbagai kegiatan pengurangan risiko bencana bersama stakeholder terkait kami mencoba pada tahun mulai kami uh, kegiatan tersebut kami laksanakan pada tahun 2013 dengan uh, mengupayakan uh, mensosialisikan penanggulang bencana kepada 76 orang penyandang disabilitas di Kota Banda Aceh. So um, finally he joined FKMBKA um, that's under Natural Aceh organization and uh, FKMBKA do the project because uh, he proposed disaster risk management um, like for people with disability. And um, for a couple years before, we already worked with several stakeholders such as DRF, like I already mentioned you before, and also the government. Some of the government are really supportive, but some of them not really supportive. Kami setelah melaksanakan pengurangan risiko bencana ke delapan itu delapan daerah tingkat dua di Aceh. Selain itu juga tiga di Kota Bandar. Jadi sepuluh eh sebelas sebelas kali kegiatan pengurangan risiko bencana yang kami laksanakan, yaitu berupa berupa diskusi publik, workshop dan simulasi. So the project include the simulation, work, workshop, and also public discussion. Selanjutnya, uh, kami sekarang ini sedang melaks uh, mengupayakan membuat semacam uh, peraturan wali kota Banda Aceh tentang uh, penghormatan perlindungan dan pemenuhan hak-hak penyandang disabilitas Kota Banda Aceh serta e, peraturan Wali Kota Banda Aceh tentang standar operasional prosedur pengurangan risiko bencana bagi penyandang disabilitas Kota Banda Aceh. Kemudian setelah itu e, ke depan kami juga akan melaksanakan e, <tuh> pengurangan risiko bencana di 43 kecamatan dalam seluruh di seluruh wilayah Provinsi Aceh. Jadi harapan saya kepada para donatur, kepada semua yang hadir, marilah bersama-sama kita wujudkan penyandang disabilitas dunia yang tangguh terhadap bencana. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang. Okay, um, so he told you that currently we also try to advocate the government to implement the new policy right away. And he hopes that our donor will be supportive about this problem, about uh, disaster risk reduction issue. So um, to wrap up about our organization and also our project, um, I would like to say that our organization is very small if we compare it with other organizations that attend um, zero conference today. But like uh, a person, a speaker tell us before, like in rural development, um, in rural development panel, he told us if you want to do something, if you want to start doing something like innovative one started in a small scale. So that's what we do. And we hope um, maybe we can change something in our province, maybe not nationally or internationally, but really something uh, that is more feasible in our province, such as uh, implementing risk, uh, disaster risk management for people with disability. That's all, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed um, for sharing your experience and, and also um, to Mr. Shereffuddin for the first-hand experience. Um, I think 
The Aceh tsunami is particularly striking for me because it happened at a time in the disability treaty negotiations when what was then the draft for Article 11 was a very different draft. It was much more narrow and um, there were many delegations that were not supportive of it remaining in the treaty text. And then the tsunami happened and we had a very clear, unambiguous example of why we needed to have an article uh, addressing exactly these issues. Um, so as awful as it was, that is one, one good thing that, that came out of that, um, in addition to the disability inclusive work that you're doing now. We have a bit of time left and we want to now throw it open to you because I'm sure you have questions, comments, experiences that you would like to share with us, ideas. So I'd like to turn it over to you, please. Uh, if you speak, wave. Um, press the button so that the microphone will work. If you could give us your name and your, where you're from um, and your comment, please. And don't be shy. This is a small, a relatively small room. M1, you get the excuse of being shy in M1. Diana in the back. Thank you. Um, thanks all, to all of you for the presentations and uh, thanks for the call out, FKM Becca. <laughs> Um, and I, my question is directed towards Alex from Lumos. Um, I really appreciate the work that Lumos is doing. Um, I previously led the Mental Disability Advocacy Center before starting the Disability Rights Fund, so I'm very aware of the kinds of things that you're talking about and the rights abuses in institutions, especially for um, children with disabilities and other with disabilities. Um, my question for you is, we, we work in Haiti, among other places, and we just had a delegation of 12 um, members of the disability community um, in Geneva last week at the CRPD committee, um, which was reviewing Haiti uh, for conditions for persons with disabilities. Um, it was fantastic that we were able to get such a large group of people with disabilities to go to Haiti. Uh, I mean to Geneva <laughs> from Haiti, um, and uh, to testify um, on their experience. Is Lumos uh, involved in any of, of those uh, processes? Um, and if not, why not? Well, the answer is yes. So, um, well, it, it's, uh, our work in Haiti has, has been, um, slightly more difficult to the, the historic work that we've done in Europe, just because of the fact in Europe when systems reform, they tend to be funded and led by the government. So once you convince the government to make a set of changes, that system, not, not that it's very easy and linear, but the state has a lot more control in being able to influence systems. In, in Haiti, what we've seen is just uh, a lot more of a, a fragmentation of services that are provided. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this huge influx of well-intended funding from um, North America starts to create this parallel system where actually the, the um, eBears, the Child Welfare and Protection Department in Haiti, has a tiny, tiny budget in comparison to the money that's coming in to support um, orphanages uh, within the country. So it's very difficult to get, and, and probably your experience is very strong coordinated networks at a national level just because of the fragmentation of services and what we've found again is in some of the orphanages that we've worked in and worked to help close down is understanding of very basic things like simply how many children are in there just aren't known by anyone in the system so then if you look for what well, what are the needs of those children there you know there'll, there'll be no understanding certainly from governments and, and actually from a lot of international funders that um, an institution might have children with disabilities there there's no extra provision provided, let alone trying to give children a voice um, and, and doing the, taking the kind of opportunity that you were able to do last week uh, in Geneva. So part of what we are trying to do in our approach is, is to give children who've had control and their voice taken away from them, is to start to give them opportunities to be able to influence first their immediate situation, but gradually as, as we work and support them longer to, to be able to uh, become leaders in their own right in the country and it sounds like what you did last week in Geneva is a br brilliant example of that. Our, 
our experience has been that it's not been um, so well coordinated, but it's a strong component of the work that we do in, in countries. Other questions, comments? I have many, so I'm happy to fill. Do you want to do a follow-up? Uh, well, no, I'll, I'll switch my attention now to, to another, <laughs> to, to FKM Becca, um, I, uh, which is a, has been a grantee of the Disability Rights Fund for their work on inclusive disaster risk management. Uh, I wanted to ask if you could explain um, whether the new Disability Act that was passed in February of 2016 in Indonesia um, due to the advocacy of the disability rights movement there, um, whether that has had any positive impact yet at the provincial level in, in, your, in your province in particular, in Aceh. Okay, um, well, I would like to say no, not yet to, I mean, uh, no, at least not in our province, because uh, I don't know, the government doesn't, maybe they don't even realize yet about that issue. Even though there are so many advocates um, in Aceh, it, it's still, um, there are no great impact from the government side, but there are so many impact for the society, but not from the government, not yet. That's it. I have a question. Uh, I, a number of you in, in your presentations touched upon the issue of community engagement, the importance of that, and that's something that we talk about a lot, but in terms of how you actually make that happen, I'm wondering if you could very briefly, um, just in the time we have left, um, just briefly, if you had advice for somebody who wants to engage the community, both in terms of whether it's an assessment or um, getting people's input on, on what the needs on the ground are, um, if you have any tips for people who are interested in practical tips on how to make that happen, um, to do that in an accessible and inclusive way, I wonder if we could just go down the line. Dorji, would you like to start first? Uh, Nepal is one of the poorest countries in the world, and uh, and the needs of the people are really, really uh, beyond our imagination. <clears throat> so, like uh, as you ask, I, know, I normally visit uh, out of Kathmandu. I uh, every six months I go out there and meet the people, and then uh, we get a lot of inquiries from uh, from the village committee people. And uh, now, uh, then I get all the feedback from the people from our people, from the school's uh, headmaster and the committee members. So that's how I, 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 I create a committee in all the, uh, in all the schools that we help. Uh, the village committee people, the school headmasters and the parents. And through them I get to know all the, the, the needs. Now uh, recently, just before I came here, and they requested that they needed uh, uh, agriculture. They wanted to do some uh, you know, farming and all that, but the water was and the water hole was quite far away, so we got them a motor pump and then got a pipe, and, and now they're happy with it. Such small things are what uh, the villagers need. We don't need very fancy uh, things like that. And so we have been able to help in many places that way. Thank you. It seems as though you're reaching out to identified community leaders as at least a first stopping point in that engagement. Thank you. Um, I know, Burinder, you wanted yeah. to speak. Yeah. Oh. The yeah. for you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, th thank you so much for this question. Microphone is yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the, the, the essence of uh, the inclusive democracy in Nepal is the community mobilization. Uh, from the government system also, there are various community level groups, the civil society groups, the war committee groups, and the water users group, the forest users group, they are from the civil society organization. We engage people with disability within all these community groups so that the disability can be mainstream within their own network and within the different aspects of the de development agendas. Like uh, the disability has been accommodated within the uh, disaster preparedness plan of the local development, the Ministry of Federal and Local Development, 
and disability has been accommodated within the other aspects of the development uh, by the engagement of the people with disability through the local community. In fact, uh, uh, our project also covered the same essence and mobilized the paralegals. The paralegals are those who just pushed for the local government to make the rights realization, not only making the rights within the paper, but to make it happen and make it in practice. So paralegals are the community people who are being engaged and uh, participated in the local community groups as well as the government mechanism in the community level. So this way, the community is being engaged in the development agendas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Erna, do you have something quickly yes. to add? <clears throat> Uh, we start our project by engaging people with disability first. We ask them what they really need because they know best about their needs. And then we summarize uh, about the pro proposed project and then we write something on the newspaper and also social media to uh, mainstreaming the idea and then uh, we point out to the government that it is their responsibility to take care of the inclusive risk disaster, disaster risk management for people with disability. Great. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you everybody for those practical tips and we are, we are slightly over time now, so I, we realize we're standing between you and a, a voucher for a sandwich. So with that, we will wrap up. But one last round of applause, please, for our panel.